going to start by just introducing each of our nominees. On the far end, we have Anne Morgan from Bombshell. Mm. Mm. Uh, Nikki Liederman from Joker. <laughs> Tristan Vaslaus from 1917. <laughs> and then Barry Gower, Tapio Salmi, and Lizzie Annie Georgiou from Rocket Man. <laughs> we'll talk about each of the films individually. I just wanted to put the first question out to all of you. In terms of these particular films, when you first got the script, what was the first thing that kind of spoke to you about each of the films? Um, we'll start at the end with Anne. Okay. Uh, I think that first, uh, the density of the script of characters that were real life characters and uh, knowing that people would know, certainly in the United States, that they would know who those characters were. So knowing that we would have to clearly make people look similar or something that people would understand them. And then twofold to that is the Fox world is a world that I, I wasn't familiar with. It's not a, a news station that I tune into per se, <laughs> but um, it is its own microcosm of a world. And, and that was what I was looking at. Like, wow, it's, uh, you know, mastering that. So that was my first impression. Nikki with the Joker. Um, it was not so much seeing the script, it's to hear from my producer who has hired me. She says, oh yeah, by the way, it's gonna be the Joker. I think that to me was like, oh my God, <laughs> how am I supposed to do a Joker? There's been so many amazing Jokers. It was like terrifying and exciting at the same time. So that was really my initial thought when hearing I'm going to be doing the Joker and I have to come up with a new iconic look that I have no idea how I'm going to do that. So that was pretty much <laughs> my first initial reaction to the movie itself. And then Tristan with 1917. I think it, from the script it was the journey. It was the journey the characters go through and the, the intensity of following those characters throughout and the quantity of soldiers and characters and everything that kind of comes through their path on that journey. So I think it was trying to figure out the quantity, the detail within that journey and how it was all going to be placed. So it all kind of adds to the, to the story, I think. And with us, yeah. it was um, obviously Elton John's one of the sort of hugest stars in the world. Yeah. So that was really exciting. But to actually then see the, the space of time that we would have to cover, that, you know, we had to cover 40 years and then to realise that there's dance numbers as well um, on top of that, and those dance numbers carry you through to the next era. So that was all quite, you know, it was quite sort of or inspiring, but also daunting to sort of try to, you know, see how we were going to actually change Taron from a 17-year-old Elton right the way through to a 40-year-old Elton, and you know, and also all the people that go with him as well, his mother, his his grandmother, his um, stepfather. All those people had to age with him as well, so it was a massive task. Um, in terms of talking yeah. about the hair and yeah. changing, kind of going from that 17-year-old then through yeah, the that. decades and then yeah. back and forth, the kind of obviously not filming the same time period, sometimes, yeah. you know, the same day or even the next day. Yeah. How, what kind of, what's your team look like for that and how do you kind of work to yeah, make Barry sure... Barry all this sort of the little prosthetic pieces for Tarrant and, and the other people in his family and um, Bernie as well, and we sort of did tests and, and made sure that we, we weren't overloading the characters. So we had to be very considerate, really, because not only were we having to age Taron and age these other actors, but we were also doing... Um, we were trying to make them look like somebody as well. So it was... I mean, we started off originally... We, were, we, we might have been doing quite extensive pieces on Taron to round his face and getting closer to Elton, but it was just going to be so extensive it would never really work on a day-to-day -day sort of basis. So uh, it was really just... Consideration was yeah. really in sort of. And with Taron, we had um, we had um, three people that were with him most of the time, especially when the prosthetics were on, because he had a board cap as well and a wig on top of that, and then little sideburns, mm. little eyebrows, like you know, little little mouth mouth no neck mm -hmm. label line. And we originally did make little jowls, jowls yeah. as well, but um, the reflection on one of the costumes was troubling the cameraman so we had to kind of drop that after the you know we did shoot on it for a day and then we had to subtly lose that um but all those were like um you know that we had little hairs imprinted into them as well so that it would match his hairline because we 
let him have a beard, more of a beard line there to show him breaking down when he's taking drugs mm. and he's not feeling himself. So there was all these other little tricks that you did that helped the prosthetics along. So it wasn't a great bit. It was there was there was prosthetics, but it was all the other things that kind of went with it as well. So an image and aesthetic is so much yeah. of what he is known yeah. for. So to be able yeah. to show kind of the darker side of his life through those through same that. things yeah. as well yeah. is um very impressive. That was quite yeah. tearful actually. Yeah. <laughs> One of the memorable <coughs> moments was when Kit sang the yeah. I Need Love. Yeah. It was very beginning of the film. We were shooting it and mm. everybody was just like in tears mm. almost and was sad because it was just so powerful. Mm. It, it was a beautiful song. I suppose then moving on to another little bit of darkness with Joker in a way, <laughs> um, but with clowns. Um, I don't know if uh, Nikki, if this is correct in my reading, but uh, lots of clown looks, especially within the film world, have they been copyrighted? Every clown look that you know, yeah. or think you know, or is out there that you don't know is copywritten. And it's funny, there's actually a cute little book that has every clown design painted on a little egg. And that's sort of the registry of the clown makeup looks that are registered. And of course, we all had this book, you know, to make sure like we can't do this, we can't do this, we can't even go near this, you know. So that was a big challenge to come up with something that was not copywritten. I suppose what's so different about this Joker is that it is set in our world or in a natural world. So in that vein, I'm not sure, but does the makeup have to then reflect someone that is maybe applying it more themselves and more in a naturalistic way? And, right. and how did you work? I suppose we were keen to kind of create, you know, a self-applied look that is obviously very stylized at the right. same time. Well, it was very important that the makeup look is not like the perfect, precise clown makeup. Um, the makeup needed to look imperfect. It needed to look that pretty much anybody can put it on themselves. And because Joaquin is partially putting on some of the makeup himself in the movie, you know, we had to make sure that, you know, it, it looks authentic and mm. organic in that way. And because of when Joaquin's very complex process of preparing for the character, it was actually quite helpful because he wasn't really like, he couldn't really sit that still and he was always like on the go and he's not the kind of person that likes to be touched that much. Mm. Kind of made it easier for me to not spend too much time with him and not get it too perfect. In fact, you know, I had to go really fast. The whole hair and makeup, Kay, um, who was the hair designer, um, she applied the wig while I was doing the makeup and all in all. It took us no more between like, you know, 25 minutes to get it all done. It actually works pretty well, surprisingly, right? I mean, it's really, it was fascinating, an incredible experience. So, yeah, so that's how, you know, we kind of worked throughout the movie with him. Um, Anne, yes. with Bombshell. Yes. Um, so you worked on the hair design yes. of the film, and kind of Bombshell is the story of kind of the Me Too movement within Fox News, and again, I suppose in the same way when we talk about caricature and not wanting that with Rocketman, um, I suppose you might not have wanted to play into the character of what a Fox News woman mm. looks like and kind of play into that, you know, the preconceptions that people have and kind of the preconceptions that the film is trying to fight at the same point. Right. So kind of how did you work on kind of still having the Fox look, right. but without it but playing into kind of all of our preconceptions of what that might be? Yeah, it's a funny thing, you know, because our um, attention went to not... Uh, demeaning these women um, and making sure that we gave, you know, we, we let them have the validity of telling their story, you know, and, and, and I say demeaning them by way of Roger Ailes had created and curated a look that was, um, you know, slowly over time. He wasn't just a leg man. It was about, you know, more hair, more blonde. And that's a Fox News fact. Like 98% of the women at Fox are blondes that are on camera. I mean, that's pretty crazy. You go down the rabbit hole of looking at blondes and you're like, it was a particular kind of blonde. I mean, it's a head turning, a head turning thing. You know, light causes the eye to turn, right? And a blonde turns a head and Roger Ailes knew this and really just 
curated this look. And, and that's what was so kind of crazy when we did that transformation of Kayla's character, is that when we did the Fox makeover, I mean, it was obnoxious. It's, it's three layers of lashes. It's so much makeup. I mean, and then I used Wes in her wig, and her wig was just a nice, you know, nor, you know, normal weight to a girl's hair. Mm -hmm. And then normally, if someone wants to add some wefts into your hair to give a little bit of wah wah, is <laughs> like, you know, maybe you got six tops, right? Mm -hmm. But there was 24 in her head. Oh it was insane, <laughs> and you know, she could barely walk in the dress. And it was like, but this was not like we're not making fun. Mm -hmm. Like this was a very typical thing. And what was so amazing is when I went down the rabbit hole of looking at Fox and the women that were being portrayed and the women that are real from Fox, it was, it was an amazing to me like, like subculture that is not a subculture at all. And we in fact take it for granted that that would be like, oh, that's not a big deal. But when you strip it down and you see all the things and the overtly sexualized Barbie doll, it, was, it, it becomes a caricature that you try and, and ease up. And because we shot it like cinema verite, it had a sense of reality to it. You know, the camera moves a lot. And, um, and we let things be fuzzy and a little broken in that. You know, and you see Megan with no makeup on or Gretchen Carlson with no makeup mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, with prosthetic pieces on. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, nose to nose, you're not seeing anything. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And then, Tristan, if we're moving to the other extreme of prosthetics, then with yeah. 1917, um, let's start kind of in the idea of this, the single take nature of the film and how that affects the way you work and kind of, you know, with creating prosthetics. You know, I'm sure that that had brought a new range of challenges that perhaps you had never worked with before. From the very beginning, talking with Sam. It was, it was the one shot, and we were planning it like three months before we started the shoot. So we were all in on it. We were all talking about how everything needed to be designed and figured out. And quite quickly, we started to get a sense of that shot and how things were laid into the shot and the periphery of everything as the characters are moving. There was no edits, cutaways, you know. So everything had to be dressed into the shot to a specific place almost so the camera catches it at the right moment. We had to have the freedom for Sam and Roger to change on the day if we needed to. So everything was built as, 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 as sort of high detail as possible. Everything, like all the heads, for example, were hair punched rather than wigs, because I wanted to be able to offer as much, much, as much flexibility in the scene as possible mm -hmm. for Sam. You know, we could, the, the bodies were all articulated. Everything was prepared in a way that we could change. They could, they could be on set. The actors could feel the moment differently. Roger might want to move the camera differently. So everything was prepared to, to, to be changeable, do you know what I mean? Um, I think it, it, it felt like theatre to me. The way the, the, we sort of shot it in sequence, more or less, and it just, it, you could feel it on sets. And I think that, I realised quite early on, was important to the way we built everything. It had to be to your eye. It wasn't a trick, but, you know, we didn't, the camera moved around there, there was no back of the head, or there was no makeup there, or, do you know what I mean? Everything had to be fully realised on set. To a, to a level where you just believe it right there and then, and that allowed the actors and everyone to sort of feel it and move through the scene um, and bring that reality out of, of what was happening. I mean, we were dealing with, with real history and, mm. and the whole story was pieced together from sto real stories and diaries and some stories from Sam's, Sam's grandfather. So it, we had to be sensitive to that level of detail as well. So if we were making corpses, bodies, injuries, they couldn't be overly graphic or just too much because it would take you out of the story. You know, it had to be real enough for you to believe it's there, um, that you have a, a de decaying horse or body or an injury, but it, hadn't, it couldn't shock you and make you, take you out of that journey that you were focused on with, with, um, with Schofield. Um, I think that was It does was cool, have a though. huge impact mm. when you're watching it. Mm. Um, I'm going to open up to the audience now. I'm sure we've all got lots of questions. There are a couple of roving mics. If you can wait for a microphone. Um, I've got a microphone just there. Yeah. I wondered if there was um, a specific look or a film that had inspired you and that you recall is the moment you knew this was what you wanted to do as a career. The reason why I wanted to go into makeup was when I was 14, I saw The Exorcist. 
And I was like, what is this? Oh my God, how did they do that? That was my first like makeup. Wow, this is amazing. I want to do that. Uh, I went to Universal Studios when I was in fourth grade. And I saw them change someone into Abe Lincoln. And uh, I w became like I obsessed with that. And then, you know, you go, you, life goes on. And then I circled back around. Yeah. Yeah, so it was fourth grade, Abe Lincoln. <laughs> Tristan? I picked up a couple of books, early books, like the Dick Smith book and Tom Savini, and I just got really fascinated. And each page I turned, I was like, oh my God. Like, and seeing behind the scenes and the molds and the sculpting, I just didn't, knew, I didn't know that world existed. So I just got captivated by mm -hmm. behind the scenes, fell in love, I love movies anyway, but fell in love further with movies and just characters and monsters and just the creation of makeups and how you can turn someone or something into something that didn't exist before and bring it to life. I just sort of fell into that world and just love it. <laughs> I remember seeing a documentary about, um, I think it was an American Wolf in London um, and the work that Rick Baker did. Uh, it was about 1981, 82 or something. And I remember just being really inspired and awed by it and thinking, my God, somebody can do this as a for a career and a living. So I think from that point, I mean, I, I was probably about sort of seven or eight years old um, and hadn't seen the film itself, but seen the behind the scenes uh, making it off. So I think from that point, I, I decided I, I wanted to be a, a bit of a monster maker. And um, uh, like as Tristan was saying, I think it was sort of mid 80s, I was picking up books by um, um, Tom Savini and uh, Dick Smith and just trying, trying at home, gluing bits of rubber and plaster and latex and stuff all, all, all over my face. Um, and, and then it, it, I think it's just steamrolled from there, really, sort of following the work of uh, Rick Baker, Dick Smith, and um, all the greats, really. Well, I always been a hairdresser, <clears throat> never done anything else. And I came to London College of Fashion. I got in and um, just being in the right place at the right time. I was just inspired by Hollywood itself, actually. <laughs> um, from sort of about the age of four, I, I, was, I was in dancing and everything, and I just used to be fascinated when all the makeup came out, and we used to have people coming around to make us up for our little dance numbers, and I just thought, I can do that. <laughs> and that's how it started. Of course. Because my sister is here. So I wanted to say, when I was 10 years old, I used to torture my sister, putting kiss makeup because I was obsessed with that makeup. I used to put it on her all the time. She was six, I was 10, and every weekend, come on, let's do this. <laughs> where, where are you? Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to, I think we're out of time, so I want to thank you all so much for coming. Congratulations on your well-deserved nominations. I want to thank Lancome for supporting this session, and thank you all for coming out. Yeah.